So, good evening. Welcome to Reflective Worship for, I think, October. Yes, just, <laughs> October, yeah. just, just into October. It's lovely to have you all here in St John's. And people who are watching on the video, it's lovely to have you join us too. Um, today we're going to be uh, completing our short trip through the letter to the Philippians. Um, Paul's going to be speaking to us today. Um, it's actually got a title for his sermon, yes. which was Think on These Things. Mm, that's right. Think on these things. So we will indeed be thinking on these things. So hopefully you've all got a green leaflet um, and various other things. So let's uh, start with the opening responses on the front. Peace on each one who comes in need. Peace on each one who comes in joy. Peace on each one who offers prayer. Peace on each one who offers song. Peace of the Maker, peace of the Son. Peace of the Spirit, the three in one. So we're going to start by singing. I'm going to sing the song which you've got on the single leaflet, Light of the World. And I've chosen this uh, because a couple of months ago, when we were looking at Philippians, we were thinking about that wonderful hymn about who Jesus is, about how he emptied himself and came down to earth. And it finishes with the idea uh, that um, at the end, every knee will bow before Jesus. So this idea, light of the world, uh, picks up that theme. So um, let's sing. Here I am to have that. Here I am to say. 
of page one. Oh God, for your love for us warm and brooding, which has brought us to birth and opened our eyes to the beauty and wonder of creation, we, we give you thanks. thanks. For your love for us wild and freeing, which has awakened us to the energy of life, to the sap that flows, the blood that pulses, the heart that sings. We, we give, give you thanks. thanks. For your love for us, compassionate and patient, which has carried us through our pain, wept beside us in our sin, and waited with us in our confusion. We, we give, give you thanks. thanks. For your love for us, strong and challenging, which has called us to risk for you, asked for the best in us, and shown us how to serve. We, we give you thanks. O oh God, we come to celebrate that your Holy Spirit is deep within us and at the heart of all life. Forgive us when we forget your gift of love made known to us in Jesus and draw us into your presence. So we're going to sing again now. If you'd like to take our orange hymn books, we're going to sing a rather old school hymn, in fact. Number 580, good old Charles Wesley song, Rejoice the Lord is King. And the reason we are going to sing this will become apparent following the song, the hymn, when we have our reading. So let's, uh, let's rejoice. Oh, 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 oh,
Linda and then Sarah are going to really read to us from Philippians chapter 4. I'm sorry, I forgot to check what page it's on. So 1170. 1180. So um, if you haven't got a Bible and would like one, there's one here. There we go. So everybody else got sight of one if they want one. Okay. My brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. I plead with Euodia and I plead with Tintich to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal young fellow, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the Book of Life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me, or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice greatly in the Lord, that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Yes, it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except only you. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me <coughs> only again and again when I was in need. Not that I am looking for a gift, but I am looking for what may be credited to your account. <coughs> I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied, and now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, they are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet all the saints in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send greetings. All the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Amen. So our short journey through Paul's letter to the Philippians comes to an end today. We said at the outset three months ago that this letter is different from Paul's other letters in its warm and encouraging. It contains none of the criticisms present elsewhere and it shows Paul in a very different light. The church in Philippi was certainly very fond of Paul and he they. 
And over these past few uh, reflective worships, we've seen and talked about some of the wide range of issues covered in the letter, such as suffering, death, unity, humility, the example of Jesus himself. And today as we come to the final chapter, well like many final chapters of Paul's letters, much of it's about personal encouragements and messages. But there are some thoughts that we can take to heart that still apply to us today. So I want to think about in particular verses 6 to 9. I'm going to read them from slightly different translations to the one that Linda read. But uh, the gist is the same anyway. <coughs> Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart, hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence and if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Well, this time last week, well, not quite this time, because we were in a hotel this time last week, but this time last week we were walking along the line of Hadrian's Wall. And times away like that give us an opportunity to leave behind all the anxieties and troubles, to enjoy the moment, to appreciate the beauty and the wonder of the world around us, to relax and find refreshment. Of course, for you, it may not be walking that gives you that chance. Perhaps it might be relaxing by a pool or looking around National Trust properties, or looking after the garden, or whatever it might be. The important thing is to get away from the regular routine things of life and have that opportunity for relaxation and refreshment. But of course the worries and concerns don't go away. Personal worries, national ones, global ones. The world isn't mended by our taking time out. At the end we have to come back to reality. And I think it's this that Paul is trying to address here, the tension between the things that drag us down and the things that give us life, the things that are life-draining and those that are life-enhancing, and how the way we think and the attitudes we have can help us become positive influences in the world around us. When we look at the television news or read newspapers, we can get overwhelmed by the bad and the sad the murder of a young woman as a result of ever escalating knife violence in London. More than a hundred people dying in a fire at a wedding in Iraq, attacks on mosques in Pakistan, the ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine, the effects of climate change as shown in extreme weather events, the biodiversity loss highlighted in this week's State of Nature report, to name but a few things in the news at the moment. And I guess we often feel powerless and helpless. What can we do when there's so much pain and suffering, when the issues are so large, when it seems that there's nothing we can do to influence or change things? But in this chapter, Paul says to us to take our worries to God in prayer. And I'm sure we all do that. But if you're anything like me, you'll be saying, yes, but what can I do? A feeling that prayer, however important, is not quite enough by itself. And maybe our view of prayer needs expanding. And I hope over the next four or five weeks, as we preach Sunday morning by Sunday morning in all three churches on the Lord's Prayer, that's something that will happen. Perhaps too, though, Paul's further advice here about that attitude to life gives us the clue we need to what we can do, how we can begin to make a difference and be that difference. I read those words again. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Paul is essentially talking about having a positive attitude, focusing on the good and not the bad, seeing possibilities and not hurdles. When I began thinking about these words, my initial thoughts were to say that this kind of attitude is the kind of attitude that we might have or desire when on holiday, when we remove ourselves from the pressures, when we put real life on hold for a week or two. 
But as we said before, we have to come back to reality and face the truths of the world again. So is it possible to have this kind of attitude when we're in the midst of our daily routine, with our worries and concerns and the world's worries and concerns on our mind? Can we be positive in the world that seeks to drag us down into the mire? Well, I've kind of come across two examples this week, maybe more, but I can think of two, that might help us in these things. Some of you may have read the blog that we wrote about our trip. And one of the things we mentioned in the blog uh, of our walk was the Lantern Initiative at Newcastle Cathedral. We went to and spent uh, a few, an hour or two in Newcastle Cathedral last Tuesday, it was, and the morning prayer there. And we found out that the leadership of the cathedral has a real desire to reach out to those on the edges of society, to make a difference. So when the cafe in the cathedral opened again after the lockdown, they began to employ released prisoners and to have others on work experience while on day release from prison working in the cafe. They also came to an arrangement with the prison bakery where prisoners are learning a new trade that will help them to lead better lives when released. They came to that arrangement to supply the cafe with all the breads and cakes that they need. Of course they're not solving the whole world's problems by doing that, but by doing something simple, something small, they're beginning to make a difference rather than just saying there's nothing we can do. Then on Wednesday evening I was at an information evening with the Diocesan Director of Mission Support. They have such great titles in the diocese. <laughs> Diocesan Director of Mission Support. And he was talking about youth and children's work in churches, but to youth work in particular. And the temptation for me and Shirley, and for us all, I suppose, is to say, we don't have any youth work. We don't have the resources. We don't have any real contact with young people. So we don't do youth work here. The whole idea of youth work is too big for us to even think about. But he urged us to think small, not to think big, to think small. To consider the few links we have, think about how we can take small steps to build better and deeper relationships with those few people few young people we do have contact with. He gave an example of a parish who have a messy church, like ours, where some of the older children, perhaps nine or ten year olds, are beginning to lose interest, like ours. <laughs> and this pub parish had a, seen a need to keep in contact with these nine and ten year olds and realised that they might be able to do something small. They set up a monthly Sunday afternoon drop-in in the local Costa for hot chocolate. And now several months on, numbers are better than they'd hoped for, and real relationships are being formed with those youngsters who just loved having hot chocolate. And they asked the youngsters actually for a name for this group. It was a dangerous thing to do. <laughs> but the youngsters came up with the name St Costas for the group. <laughs> <laughs> so two stories about thinking positively and using that positive thinking to begin to make a small difference. We also heard this morning in our harvest service about the small things we can do as we fight climate change, modifying our diet, being careful with using water and other resources and so on. The voices in the world around us, mostly media driven and negative, always out to bring people down, to tell the bad news stories, to shock and make us despair. And they have their effect, don't they? They create a what's the point and a what can we do mentality a mentality which encourages us to imagine that things were better in the past and can never be good again. Paul urges the opposite. Concentrate, he says, on the good and wholesome, the true and the praiseworthy, the things that give hope and open the door to possibilities. Think on these things, he says. And as we do, we will, I'm sure, begin to see how the world can be changed and what part we can play. So I want us this evening to think on those things, not to think of new ideas that we can do, but to think of examples that you've seen where people have done small things that have began to make a difference in the world. I'm sure we can all think of some examples, some of the ones we heard this morning perhaps, or others. We're going to play a bit of music now, first of all, as we think back over the last week, the last couple of weeks, as examples of where people have made small changes to their own lives or to the lives of their communities, which have made a difference small things through positive thinking and then as the music comes to an end I invite you if you've got an idea if you've got a thought 
uh, when the music stops, to light a candle, just tell us what that thought is, what that example is, so we can be encouraged of the small things we know where people are making a difference in the world. So we'll play some music first, and then <coughs> we'll, uh, as we think about examples, and then if you want to give an example, light a candle and tell us what that example is, so we can be encouraged by it. You thought of an example, tell us it and light a candle. I had a very uplifting moment on a feeder coach at Johnson's to go up to uh, Scotland, and this woman had lost her husband. But she was a very friendly person and she wanted to get get people to um, to learn canastra by cards. And um, she set out to talk to people to see what interest she could get. Nothing. But once she sent out notes to all the people around, she got about 17 replies. Oh, brilliant. Because it was controlled and supervised by this one woman. Nice. They were prepared to listen to her, but not to do any work. Uh, and she said she's up to 36 now. And it was on a Sunday in, a, in one of the houses, you know. But uh, I said, how did you get on with uh, coffee and tea? Oh, no, we won't do it. So we didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was absolutely brilliant. I think there's somebody who has really gone forward, you know. So that is my. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't realise how people take that. But I'm 
going to light a candle. For the cafe. Because I think that's just an absolutely phenomenal thing that happens every Tuesday morning. With so many people who are potentially lonely, cold, or just in need of some company. And um, yeah, the love and the care and the kind of sense of belonging that people find there. I think is wonderful. So I'm lighting a candle for the cafe. And I'm going to light one partly for the cafe, but for one particular person who I've known for many, many years. Not personally, but seeing her on her bike, travelling down Bill's Lane and back, and has come to the cafe and as a result of that went on one of the holidays and she said to me that it's the first time in six years since she lost her husband that she's gone anywhere. That's so and, and, and the friendship that she has got now is tremendous. I wouldn't use those, no, they're a bit awkward. Um, try, try that one instead. Thank you. young people in London and we had such a good experience with people um, mostly young people well young to me anyway <laughs> um, who not only helped us put our cases up on the um, thingamajig you know in the train and but gave up our seats on tubes gave us, gave us our their seats on tubes and buses, told us directions, <laughs> but everybody was so kind, even people who spoke very little English, but, you know, lived there and knew more than we did, and everybody was very, very, very kind. It's brilliant, because I'm going to finish the story that I only half told you this morning about my bus experience. So my candle is actually for the year three teachers at Lady Port School, but really, of course, you'll know it's for lots of teachers at lots of schools who would have found themselves, hopefully, in very similar situations. When, when um, we arrived at this bus stop, there were 28 children all very neatly, very well behaved, <laughs> lined up in their high vis vests. And there were some um, teachers, obviously, um, in their high vis vests. And the, the class teacher got on the bus and said, um, How many can, I, can I bring on? And, and the driver, that was the first thing, the driver was really lovely and said, Oh, you can bring all 28 on, but take them upstairs, keep them together. The teacher turned to say to her colleagues, you, you, we can take all 28 and the children cheer <laughs> <laughs> and that was kind of the start of it being this wonderfully drawn out magic moment so they got upstairs and they said well what better place is there to be other than on the top deck of a bus with your mates <laughs> you know and that was it and I said they, they kind of got the rest of us not looking at our phones or trying to do the crossword in the metro but actually smiling and talking to each other but when we got to the other end, I'm afraid I did something a bit odd, because I do sometimes. I wanted to say how great it had been, but obviously my class teacher was really busy getting her kids off the bus. But there was another class standing outside Primark, obviously <laughs> waiting for the one who's on the bus. So I went across to chat to that teacher and said how lovely it had been, <coughs> and how well behaved, and where were they going? <coughs> and that's how I know they were going to the think tank. But I just think, you know, it's hard doing stuff like that when you're a teacher, isn't it? And they got 
they got so well organised and the kids were really well behaved, obviously bouncing with excitement. And we forget sometimes just how hard all those things are. And there's all those teachers everywhere doing all that stuff. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. My youngest great nephew was six at the time, and the church closest to their school went visiting one day early this year and asked if any of the kids would like to join in their choir. And as I said, my nephew at the time, my great nephew, was six and he volunteered. And he's gone every single Sunday since then. He's got a favourite hymn, and I don't think that there's a, he's going to continue going and he's going to enjoy it as much as I enjoy going to church too. Brilliant. Fabulous. <laughs> this isn't a specific one, but I just think it's nice to be able to um, share smiles more sort of willingly and liberally and to just say thank you people when there's courteousness as well yeah. I think there's a lot of rushing around these days and uh, some of those things get forgotten and it makes a difference to both Wonderful, thank you. It's all people helping people, isn't it? Yeah, it's just making small contributions and yeah. making a difference. Yeah. Uh, like one, um, a friend of mine uh, who uh, had a, a quite a bad car accident this week, um, and it, it really shook them up, as, yeah. as it would do. Now, they're quite a distance from me as are the other people on, the, on this particular WhatsApp group that we share. Um, but what they were able to do, because of this group, they were able just to tell us that they'd had this experience, ask for prayer, and know they were going to get it. Mm -hmm. And social media, you can, you can get a bit of a bad name, but if used well, used positively, it can actually unite people. So she was able to put on what had happened. Please pray for me. She knew that we would, as we did. That's brilliant. That means us. Yeah. I actually have a wow moment, and I wish I'd have shared it this morning. When I left church last week, I went to Sainsbury's. Uh, I couldn't have been in there more than half an hour, and I came out. She spot my car had been scratched all the way down the side. But this lady had been waiting for me. She says, I saw the accident. She told me his um, car type, registration number, her phone number, and says, if you need me or any of the insurance need me, tell them to get in touch with me. Oh, that's so brilliant. That would have been, I would have gone to the car and not known and just had to yeah. claim on my own insurance, not yeah. my claim on his. So, yeah. Brilliant. That was a big wow moment. I yeah. couldn't, couldn't stop thanking her. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to pray over these and yeah, do it together? So good yeah. Thing, so. <coughs> uh, love and God, we thank you that uh, there are so many positive things going on in this world that never reach the newspapers, that never get the TV news, but that go on all around us. And we do pray that as we go into this week ahead, by the things we do, by the attitudes we have, help us make a difference to those around us. Amen. 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 Shall we sing this one then? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was the plan. Okay. So we're going to sing again now. Um, number 349 in the book. Jesus Christ is waiting. And just reminding us that in all the um, in all the bad news that Jesus is there and uh, that he cares too.
and that he's with us as we make these, do these sometimes small things, sometimes bigger things that make a difference in the world. So three, four, nine, Jesus Christ is waiting. And I think the second verse is slightly different words on the, on the tape, so just sing what's in the book. Don't get distracted. <laughs> worship. Let's uh, bring before God uh, the things that are on our hearts in prayer. So let's be still. Be aware of the light of God's presence with us. We bring into God's light someone we have met or remembered today and for whom we want to pray. We bring into God's light someone who is hurting tonight and needs our prayer.
We bring into God's light a troubled situation in our world tonight. We bring into God's light someone whom we find it hard to forgive or trust. And we bring ourselves further into God's light, that we might grow in generosity of spirit, in clarity of mind, and in warmth of affection. Amen. So if you'd like to turn to uh, number 332 in the book, we're going to sing I, the Lord of Sea and Sky as we commit ourselves to uh, <coughs> taking more of these lights out into God's world. <coughs> 332, sorry.
in a moment. I'll tell you when. So hopefully St Paul will forgive me for switching around a couple of his verses here, but to finish, let's just listen again to the verses uh, Paul spoke about this evening. Finally, sisters and brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. And for our blessing this evening, we're going to listen to a sung blessing which, God, which Paul is going to play for us now.